Hi everybody, I am Kim Fairminer and welcome to the Aries Ingress for 2022. I'm here with Sandra, who um, some of you may recognise her beautiful dulcet different tones from um, the Witch Radiant and Rouge podcast, which we um, co-present together with our witchy sister Shares, who provides the herbal magic. Um, we tend to lean towards the stars and that is what we are going to be checking out today. Um, yeah. Hi, Sandra. Hi, Kim. Excellent. Long time no speak. <laughs> That's not true, is it? No, it's not true. Uh, Gemini and a Libra walk into a room. <laughs> <laughs> so true. Okay. Look, um, I think we'll just start with a little bit of information about the mundane significations of the houses. I've done up a beautiful slide here um, with mundane astrology. We're kind of looking at the birth chart of a nation. Or, you know, you can do it with a corporation or like any kind of um, thing, organisation, I guess, if you will, that um, it's, it's kind of like the moment that it's come into being. So you, there's certain kind of parallels, I guess, between the birth chart of a person um, that you'd be familiar with from natal astrology but we just kind of need to tweak those houses to think in terms of collective. Um, so like, you know, everybody in the country, um, what's happening at that broader level rather than what's happening in the life of the individual. So, you know, first house first. Um, the first house is about, just like in the natal chart, it's about the person, um, their body, their well-being and health. The first house in a mundane chart is um, the country itself. Um, we're looking at Australia today um, and we'll be, yeah, we usually use the capital for the area that we're looking at. So for Australia, that's Canberra. Um, yeah, so the country and its people, the seat of power, I guess, if you will. Um, and the overall health and prosperity. So the first house is um, pretty important. House number two, just like in natal astrology, it's about wealth and assets and also in terms of mundane astrology, the financial institutions within that country. And I'm just noticing a terrible typographical error on my chart, but we'll all just live with it. <laughs> Wouldn't have noticed if you hadn't have mentioned it. Yeah, it's because I'm an editor. Um, <laughs> edited this a little bit more thoroughly. Which brings us naturally to the third house. Um, yeah, communication um, is a big one in that third house. Um, specifically for, I don't know, I love that word, propaganda here in the chart. It's about the media and how we communicate. Also how things are moved around within the country. Um, so, you know, you'd think like rail networks, road networks, any way that, um, you know, the country moves around people and goods. Um, in a natal chart, the third house is connected with um, your neighbours as well as um, kin. So in a mundane chart, we think about neighbouring countries. So for Australia, you'd be probably looking at New Zealand, Papua New Guinea, Indonesia, um, our Pacific Islander friends, um, people that are geographically close to us. House number four um, in a natal chart is generally family and home um, and also real estate. And that carries through to the mundane meanings of the chart, but it has a greater sort of um, significance in terms of land, that kind of weighty term, um, and what we get out of that land. So farming and mining it also has a direct relationship to the property market and because it's opposite the 10th house, and we will be wading into politics here, Sandra, can't wait. Um, maybe can I? Um, it's like, I don't know, it's silly and it should be like, I don't know, more important than sport, but it kind of like is sport. Um, you have two sides going at it and, um, yeah, they just kind of kick the country around like political football at times. So down there in the fourth house is where we find the opposition party and the opposition leader. So when it comes around to election time and Australia is up for an election this year, um, yeah, we'll be checking out the um, significations of the fourth house in the ingress chart. House number five um, is related to diplomats, which in the context of a uh, um, country's chart, 
would be like foreign relations people that kind of go between and um, you know take messages I guess in a way um, on the behalf of somebody else like a go between um, recreation and leisure um, children and sex also um, you know fairly typical of natal chart astrology those significations carry over to the mundane chart and also to the arts um, I think that's pretty interesting to look at um, given the context of you know where the arts have been at in the last couple of years and entertainment and just our ability to enjoy ourselves um, you know Australians supposedly have a reputation for that and uh, it's been on the ground Another thing we have a reputation for is working hard, um, probably debatable, but um, we do. We're, we're little, we pride ourselves on, I don't know, little Aussie battlers and that narrative. And that for me is all in the sixth house. So you've got your working classes, the people that are there to serve, like labourers, people that um, are on the ground. The um, unions as well, the people that serve those people are also um, in the sixth house. Also food reserves, um, which also have links to house number two, our wealth and assets, and what we get out of the ground, so the fourth house. So food, um, food security, that kind of thing would be the relationship between the second, the fourth, and the sixth. Um, something else that oh, I want to give you some examples of um, six house um, occupations. So I would think the um, like childcare workers, nurses, teachers, any kind of organisation that is unionised or should be, I would say. Um, any other occupations that spring to mind there for you, Sandra? Um, anyone who's working in nursing homes, um, tradies, it's it's kind of seen um, mundane as a the house of servants, um, but these days here in Australia we generally don't have servants, so it's those who come and do a service for you in your house, a plumber, electrician, um, but yeah, these are also uh, very heavily unionised workforces. Yeah, they're very hands on too. It's like it's a lot of it's not the kind of work that you can do remotely. No, and we've had a huge awakening this year because it's previously been regarded as unskilled labour. And I think we discovered wholeheartedly that's wrong because they were our frontline workers during the lockdowns and the pandemic. So it's been an interesting turnaround. And I think this house resonates more strong with the Australian identity than the fifth house. I think we want to be seen as your mates, but we are definitely sixth house these days. Yeah, yeah, I would um, tend to agree with how we want to be seen and how we are seen are like quite um, sort of different things. Um, yeah, which brings us to the projections, um, I guess, of the seventh house. And here, um, you know, in natal astrology, we would look at like the partner. And yeah, we find our trading partners here, the countries that we have agreements and alliances with. We also have enemies, and these are open enemies, people that you know that you don't agree with. So the seventh house has a um, direct implication for whether we're at war or um, peace. Um, so, yeah, that's that's quite important. Um, I think the eighth house is also generally quite topical when you're looking at mundane charts because, <laughs> particularly in Australia, particularly right now at the time of recording, disasters are, um, you know, kind of, top of the national consciousness right now because much of the east coast is flooded and even further north is um, a heat wave so we're uh, in sort of you know poems of an of our national consciousness we speak of um you know sunburnt country land of flooding rains in um yeah the Udru Nuffle farm I believe I think I got that wrong I might be corrected in the comments if I have um it's also debt um, and that can be like at a national level, but also that kind of collective household debt and the guy on the news that has the economics charts, um, all that kind of stuff. Taxation is also up here. And, you know, a government wouldn't govern without taxes. They need money to be able to make those rules and provide the infrastructure and services that um, they're meant to provide. 
house nine relates to religion. Um, not such a huge thing in Australia, although it does tend to pop its head up um, periodically. Foreign affairs is also in the ninth house, the travel industry and higher education. So I guess while this is kind of a less important house, sometimes the topics of that house um, gain prominence and we can see sort of, you know, house emphasis in um, the, the national charts as well as the ingress charts as well. Um, so, yeah, we'll have a look at that later. Um, the 10th house is like arguably the most important house of a mundane chart because it represents the government of the day who are essentially kind of collectively steering all of us um, towards hopefully a marvellous goal. Um, so we've got the prime minister here. We've got like the authority um, that he or she currently he holds, um, and the reputation of us collectively as a country. Um, in the 11th house is the parliament. So while we have a prime minister, we've got, um, you know, lots of other parliamentarians that, um, you know, contribute through committees, um, question time, keeping the government to account, um, doing various work and ministries, all those people are there. Um, government resources as well. So how deep the um, government, governing parties' pockets are, um, that's relevant, particularly in the context of um, elections. And, you know, the 11th House is connected to our hopes and dreams for the future. So that's where we look for, like, our collective hopes and dreams as well. Hopefully we've still got some. <laughs> Just for the sprinkling of cynicism there. And the 12th house, um, prisons, hospitals, um, particularly at for Australia, I put detention centres in there. Um, also, just like in a natal chart, secret enemies. So, like, spies. That's, um, I don't know, I shouldn't, like, say that's fun because it's really kind of not. But um, it is there and it can be a topic that, um, yeah, comes up. So... If you think in terms of like what you know about natal astrology and just kind of like imagine the baby is um, a country, Australia in this particular thing, and you'll get an idea of who's who and where to look for, um, you know, your various topics and um, sort of things. And it will help you um, follow along with the analysis that we're going to do. But, oh, here we go. Sorry, just one more person to let in. She's actually in a flood prone area, so her internet may not be reliable, but um, yeah. And this is the thing about mundane charts. You can see the disasters in the eighth house. You can see what's happening with um, property in the fourth house, with unions in the sixth. So this information that we explore at this um, collective national level can have a real impact on, you know, you as an individual and, you know, what you might be planning on doing, um, you know, in, in the year ahead. Also, who you might want to vote for um, because we do live in a democracy and that's just the way we roll. Okay, so Sandra and I did this last year. Um, we didn't sort of put it out in this forum, but in another group, um, we did a little online thing and we were just, you know, looking back, because we're still in this Aries Ingress year of 2021. And, um, yeah, we wanted to sort of, you know, look back before we look forward and see sort of what we got right. Did you want to kick it off, Sandra? Absolutely. Now, I, I was looking at these notes this morning and was actually blown away at the accuracy of um, what we predicted. Can we use the P word? Um because we didn't record it. It was just for another small and intimate gathering in another astrology group. Um, but we called it and we called it hard. So I'm very excited that Kim is recording it this time because it's always good to have these things to look back on because it is, it is the part of time that we're living in here in Australia. So when we look at that Mars ruled ascendant there in Scorpio, um, the vibe of the year, because that is how we're feeling as a nation was, 
lots of talk about death and mortality rates um, and the impact of uh, the current climate on our creative and sporting industries. Now, everything was killed last year and is only just coming back to life. Um, there was a lot of talk about the stock market and risky ventures. We saw cryptocurrency become this insanely hot topic. It was up, it was down, it was all over the place. Um, and we saw the stock market take a few serious hits and then bounce back up again. Um, we saw our Prime Minister copper hit. One of the things that we predicted um, with, let me look at it, it was the Prime Minister copying some anger from women two times across the year and we were dead on accurate. Um, he bored himself undone, basically. Yeah, and it's interesting because we're in an election year this year here in Australia and we generally have, have a two-party preferred system um, and one is seen as more conservative than the other. Um, our Labor Party is seen as fighting for workers' rights and historically we have this to and fro that when one party is in um, power, we get higher taxes and we get, um, they're seen as working more for the wealthy. And when the other party is in power, they're seen as being more about unions and sharing with the working class people. Um, and we predicted that that was going to happen with public welfare and spending because of that eighth house, moon, north node and Mars. Um, health, health workers were a hot topic. We had the sun in the sixth house um, and that was, that was all we talked about all year. Our frontline workers, our health workers burned out, very Mars word. Um, what else did we have in here? The weather. Okay, so we predicted that with Saturn and Jupiter down there in the fourth house, uh, our weather was going to be erratic and our farmers were going to cop it again. Um, it's very interesting because as we speak right now, we've just lived through a unprecedented uh, series of storms up and down the East Coast and uh, food distribution chains are screwed. We have McDonald's, which everybody all around the world relies on, closed here in Southeast Queensland because they cannot get food through the distribution centres. Uh, so that was a very interesting footnote. And as Kim said, we aren't finished yet. We've still got a few more weeks. Um, but when you have a global conglomerate food chain like McDonald's closed all over Southeast Queensland because the food cannot get to the place it's meant to be, you got some pretty big issues. Yeah, wow. I didn't actually know McDonald's was closed. Um, many, many. <laughs> Instead of catching up on the news. Yeah, no, many, many McDonald's. And Guzman and Gomez, um, KFCs, just these are places that we just assume will run no matter what. You just, it's, you don't hear of McDonald's closing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I could, I could wax lyrical about this because I take a lot of notes, but it played out perfectly. And when you're looking at what's going to happen for us this year, uh, it's an election year. And when you're looking at the ingress chart for 2022, um, it's written all over it. Yeah. One thing I did just want to add on this chat is regarding the election. I think there was some kind of debate in that discussion at, at um, in Aries Ingress 2021, where we talked about, well, who's going to win the election, like if it was held before this coming Ingress. And you can see that the um, Prime Minister, if you look at the um, 10th House, which was ruled by that six house son. Like he, that's a really sort of uncomfortable place for a um, leader to be. The six house is one of the least favorable houses. And you can see the opposition leader is kind of at home, um, keeping a low profile. And the, we were leaning towards if an election had been held at that time, and I'm gonna use a um, very other Australian um, piece of lingo, um, he'd pull a Steve Bradbury and just kind of get over the line by default just because he's 
not the prime minister and the, the anger like about the deaths um and the attitude towards um women and people that are in caring roles is just palpable up here in the eighth house and i think a lot of that is still simmering and i don't think um it's going to abate in these last few weeks of this particular interest chart it's still really strong no uh what we noted in that uh the ruler of the 10th city in the 6th was that there would be a lot of attention on the Prime Minister and whether he was working hard enough for us. And I think we had three distinct occasions where he was in the news for not being in the country during uh, severe crises. We had the bushfires. Mm. He was in Hawaii. Um, we had the floods. He laid low. Um, it was then, also the um, climate conference in Glasgow that he wasn't going to go. We wanted him to go and he's like, oh, I'm not really sure about this, not really committed. Um, he's just a very elusive, perhaps not as diligent as he needs to be or that we expect him to be because, you know, workers have been busting their gut. He's a worker and he should bust his gut too. No, he has not represented Australian workers. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think, too, there's an interesting link between the fixed signs on, um, well, at least the ascendant, descendant axis in this chart and in 2022's ingress chart. So there's kind of some carryover that there's not like a, a big kind of shift in the kind of baseline that we're operating on. Um, no, but, and... Yeah. Yeah. When you look at a, an, the ascendant in a mundane chart, it's Scorpio, it's a water sign and it's intense emotionally. And that is exactly how we were as a country last year. Um, after 2020's COVID arrived, we were locked down. It was all a little bit exciting, a little bit scary, a little bit unknown. And then we rode into 2021 um, seething with emotion. And it needed an outlet. Yeah, I'm not sure if it's found it yet. Perhaps it'll find it at the ballot box. <laughs> I do just want to skip through the um, two charts that we use for Australia. Um, the first one, I've labelled it as the Australian colonisation chart. Um, I'm probably going to refer to it as the invasion chart because it's essentially when um, the English turned up and planted a flag in um, Sydney Cove one summer's morning and claimed, claimed it all for themselves, um, despite the fact that there were people already um, living here. It's important um, in the context of the Aries Ingress chart to just note that um, five degree Aquarius sun, those early degrees of Aquarius are really um, quite relevant. Um, I think in the context of this chart, I was just kind of looking at, and I want to throw out some comments about um, the idea of terra nullius. Um, you've got the, the sun is the ruler of the seventh house. So there's that sense of possession of the other, um, you are mine. So kind of taking what belonged to somebody else. Um, also at the end of Aquarius there, you've got a conjunction between Saturn and Venus, to me, that's kind of like, I don't know, like the, the resources, the wealth, if we talk of Venus and the, the rooted land of um, Saturn, but also kind of like some tricky rules. Um, so like Saturn kind of is a shadowy planet, so it kind of obscures the, the truth about the land. Um, and, of course, Venus is the ruler of the fourth house here. Um, and Sandra made the, the beautiful point about um, the, the shady um, Neptune MC up there in the ninth house. Um, I pointed out that I'll just lie about the legality of it all, but you made the very valid point that at the time these people believed they were doing, you know, the right thing. They had some um, 12th house tricky um, mercurial criminals. They needed somewhere to put them. Um, and yeah, they, they just believed in their God-given mission um, despite how we respond to it now. We have grown. Oh, good. 
1788, it was very much seen as uh, they were doing the world a favour by going and popping themselves there to make everything a little bit more civilised. Um, we, in hindsight, see that that was to detriment for most of the world. <laughs> but um, it's very, very interesting with the colonisation chart that you have Saturn, which is the greater malefic, and Venus, which is the lesser benefic, conjunct. And that is very much how we are in Australia. It is uh, very... A very generous country we we have an abundance of crops that grow here we we've tamed a wild um climate um but then we have this saturnian black come through uh due to the weather <laughs> time and time again yeah that that dryness of mm. um, aquarius um yeah all right, the other chart um, that's notable for Australia is the Federation chart. So a lot of countries have a Capricorn sun simply because they, you know, draw up the paperwork and go, Woo, we'll start in the, um, in the first day of the new year. So it it's also speaks to, you know, that, that organised um, social structure, the authority that um, a nation has as well as um, kind of like the, the traditions around it. Um, you know, how we identify with the past. It's quite um, backward looking in a way, this idea of sort of nation state. Uh, but, you know, here we are um, zooming away and chatting about it. So it's interesting. Um, in this chart, I want to point out that um, the midheaven up here in the um, whole sign 11th house there is at two degrees of Aquarius, almost three. And remember in the um, invasion chart, we had the five degrees of Aquarius. Also to that 20 degree Taurus sun is relevant in the context of the upcoming um, Aries Ingress chart for 2022. Um, a couple of just, you know, interesting things I noted about this chart is it goes back to that idea that um, you brought up, Sandra, about how we, you know, appear, um, versus who we are and there's like kind of like some discrepancy we kind of don't see it so essentially we are very conservative here um and that's emphasized by the combust satin there with the sun but you know wouldn't we love to be seen as you know kind of gregarious and sporty and chatty that um Americans. mercury yeah. up there in the ninth house we, we have this uh, view of ourselves as larrikins compared to the rest of the world. Um, we're just a little bit odd down here and a little bit different. Even our animals are a little bit different. But we are really, when it comes down to a conservative, um, and that huge stellium of Sagittarius up there, Sagittarius is freedom-seeking and freedom-loving, but it can err to... Um, conservatism and dogma and um it's it's interesting when you get into astrology and start looking at the mundane aspects of the australian chart this is who we are <laughs> this is 100 percent who we are um and in with the aries ingress chart that we'll be looking at in a minute also note the 29 degrees descendant of uh, Libra there in the seventh house uh, that is important as well um, it's it's a shift is about to happen um, and we did we had a huge shift in from 1901 when this chart was cast to now uh, it's been incredible um, but yeah oh, on. yeah now that we've um, talked all around it and made um, certain allusions to it. Here's the star of the show. 2022 Ingress chart, cast for Canberra. Yay, us. Um, yeah, so look at the rising degree. Two degrees of Aquarius, which yeah. is a power degree for us as a nation. And also in terms of those larger mundane cycles, it's pretty close to where the um, Jupiter-Saturn conjunction was um, in 2020. Oh, gosh, I should have yeah. that down. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and then you'll see up there on the midheaven, we've got the moon at 29 degrees of Libra. 
Um, so astrologically, when a chart is flipped, so when you have uh, one chart, the ascendant flips over to the descendant or flips up to the midheaven, it's, it's a huge year because you are looking at things from a different perspective. And I think that's what we've lived through through the last two years. We are really looking at things from a new perspective, aren't we? Yeah, and it, it makes you question who you are at that collective level. So, like, who are we as Australians? And there's been a few sort of things leading up to this point, um, you know, at that national level, like oh, the, the submarine deal, which... Um, Beat you know, us on the butt. By, well, we weren't called a liar. When the French president suggested that the Prime Minister of Australia had been deliberately duplicitous about um, the undoing of that deal with um, the submarines in France. And well, we're supposedly honest. We've got that Jupiter-Mercury um, conjunction, which you'd think would, um, you know, help us be straightforward with that um, Aries rising as well. Like, it's not something that we identify with as being sort of, you know, Shifting. background deals with like, you know, what you see is what you get, but really, are we? Um, so we've been forced to ask that question of ourselves. So like who we are in the eyes of other people um, and what does that say about us? Because, you know, you ask these questions of the other and, you know, you're engaging with your own shadow. Um, so in collective terms, that's, um, yeah, kind of where we're at. Um, so integrating our new reputation, I would think, because that um, Federation Midheaven is so close to the um, ascendant of this Aries Ingress. There's some um, awkwardness there because, of course, um, well, perhaps it's not totally awkward. I guess it's a sextile, but there's some kind of, like shift there that um, yeah needs to happen. The Prime Minister being the main spokesperson for Australia with the midheaven shifting down to the ascendant, we want the man to speak on behalf of us honestly. And with that Mercury-Jupiter conjunction there in Pisces, so Mercury and Jupiter conjunct shows an overconfidence just generally, in, and then when it's in Pisces, um, it, there's a sense of hopefulness, um, but there's also delusion. So who's deluding who he would be would be interesting to look at. And because it's in the second house, Kim, this is this is our resources, our wealth, our integrity, even, um, and it's Scott Morrison, our current prime minister, has made us have to look at this hard. Yeah, um, the fact that the, both those planets, which are aspects of the mind um, and our beliefs, and both those planets are coming up to Neptune as well. Um, and those aspects all perfect in like the first week after the Ingress chart too. So I guess you're probably looking at about, I don't know, the first seven months there, um, maybe. Um, yeah, but... In the second house, I saw that um, conjunction between Mercury and Jupiter as these big financial ideas um, that lack detail um, and also have the potential to plunge us into a lot of debt. Like it's great to have these kind of, you know, big projects that bring us together and, um, you know, we all have a lovely time, but who's going to pay for it? Um, that Mercury there is not super happy in um, Pisces. It's the mm. sign where it um, struggles with the details because Pisces is very big picture. It's dreamland and that's not a great placement for um, your treasurer or your accountant. So like there's something missing there. There's kind of some kind of slapdash approach, big promises that are likely to kind of be well received um, because you know, everybody loves a Jupiterian bounty, but um, then Neptune comes along. And I just think it's just going to go, 
Yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah. It's giving us giving us hope, and then that hope dissolves rapidly. It's beautiful, so it's transient. Um, you also have Jupiter is growth, but it can be overstated growth, particularly in Pisces and the market. The market looks like it increases and then bursts. And don't forget, we've got Jupiter ingressing into Aries in May. So I'd be keeping my eye on once Jupiter moves out of a place where it's very, very comfortable and doesn't really have to work too hard and then move into a Mars rule sign, um, we're going to see some, some separation, immediate separations. Um, and then so Jupiter moves into Aries in May, but then it retrogrades back into Pisces in late October until late December. So if you're interested in looking at um, our finances as a country and about the markets, I'd be, I'd be looking at what happens around May and then again October, December, because um, it's going to be interesting times. Um, there's a lot being spoken about now um, from insurance companies because many, many parts of the southeast coast of Australia are uninsurable to the average person. So it'll be interesting. I mentioned to Kim last night, you know, you've got issues when insurance companies are saying the government needs to fix how we deal with this. Apparently, according to a credible news source, 97% of the money uh, is from insurance is used to clean up the mess and only 3% is used to mitigate, um, to help prevent these things from having such a devastating um, impact. You can't control the weather, but I feel Australians have become very aware that we've been let down um, through the last three bad floods we've had. Uh, the government hasn't actually put anything into place to help us at all. Yeah, I, th I think that um, flows into the next aspect that um, perfects in this chart, and that's um, Mars square Uranus. And to me, that's like very kind of like tingly, volatile energy, and it made me think of electricity. And I think there will be a kind of a, a strong pivot in energy policy and also climate policy, because here they're very much related with um, the discussion about renewable energy. And of course, Uranus is down there in the fourth house. It's getting just increasingly obvious um, that the unpredictable weather, which scientists have actually been predicting for four decades, that there will be impacts um, based on the um, amount of fossil fuels we're burning and the um, anthro anthropomorphic climate change um, and we're living this now um, the the bottom of my street flooded um, it should not have flooded um, it's not an area that normally floods um, so that scale of um, disaster and if we look at that mercury as ruler of the eighth house we talked before in the context of the 20, 2021 English chart about um, the, the death rate that in the scale of disaster, like that is all, like really present um, with it applying to Jupiter. It's like people are hopeful, but their hopes keep getting dashed. And I think there's only so long you can dash people's hopes before they're going to demand change. And that's anger um, that yeah. is very present in the form of Mars rising in that first house, um, you know, coming up to Uranus um, is really palpable. It really is. And the ascendant in an ingress chart is how are we feeling? It's our, let's take a, a, a look at a health check at how we're feeling and we're depressed, we're world weary, and we are overwhelmed with too much. It has just been bad news after bad news after bad news. And that Mars is there, it's anger because you can only be depressed so much before eventually you go, we need to deal with this. Um, it's, it's quite interesting. Uh, 
just how overwhelmed we are with one bad event after another, it's unrelenting. Yeah, I think the position of Venus there as well, that notion that we just, that, that fourth house, that, that place of rest, we can't rest because, um, because we can't rely on the food supply because we can't rely on, you know, the, the land holding us in a peaceful um, fashion. It, it's erratic um, and that Venus is just separating from um, Uranus as well. So the fact that Venus is just separating from the square to Uranus and Mars is just kind of coming in, I think that idea that, well, yes, we've survived the disaster, Venus is still benefic, um, but we're going to get angry about it, increasingly angry. And I really hope that because it's so present and strong on the ascendant that it does lead to change, um, it may come. Let's just go through the aspect center. I'm going to start wanting to talk about the election. So I need to follow Absolutely. Um, okay. So what do we want in 2022? If you have a look at that Aquarius rising. So we want a new way of doing things that need to be done. We want a more broad-minded outlook on the responsibilities on us because as Australians, we always pull together after these crises and help each other out. But where's the government? Mm. And we'll be looking at that. And I something in this chart made me think of back in the 80s, in the olden days, when the Berlin Wall fell. Um, afterwards, there was uh, this word glasnost, which was, it appealed to me for some reason. And I Googled it the other day, and it is um, the leader of Russia at the time uh, was bringing in a more consultative and approachable leadership, which is what glasnost means. Um, we, we're looking for that now as Australians. We, we want the, the fact that it's an election year, we're looking at who is going to be able to give us that. Um, conservative and hardline are not going to cut it, Kim. Um, we want action. The issue is that our opposition leader, hardly anyone knows who he is. He's, I know who he is. I have come from a political uh, family, but... The leader of the opposition party has some serious issues here with um, Uranus there in the fourth house. It's unpredictable. Um, we don't really want ScoMo anymore, Scott Morrison. You can see that. There's lots of change coming. But does that mean that we vote him out? What do you reckon? Yeah. I, I'm all for voting him out. So is the South Node there. Yeah. <laughs> Also, yep. the, you pointed out the um, 29 degree liberal moon. That's just coming off the square to Pluto as well. We like are in the mood for change and we're pretty prepared to be like ruthless about it. And we'll do it in a civilized fashion. We'll go to the ballot box and give him his marching orders. Um, but we're done. I Women. really think that, um, yeah, the national moon is. Let's take a punt on the other guy. And it's not going to be easy for him. No, if I were to offer any advice to Anthony Albanese, who is the opposition leader, it would be focus on female voters. The fourth house cusp is ruled by Venus. You've got the moon ruled by Venus. And Scott Morrison has let women down badly in the last 12 months in particular. So uh, if Albo rang me and said, listen, Sandra, how can we get this across the line? I'd be saying women focus on women, focus on female issues, focus on how you can get your sway with those who are um, suffering the repercussions of decisions that the current government has fail to follow through on or actually bring to order in the last 12 months. And that'll get him across the line. Yeah. 
I would also say to him, be careful what you wish for, because that Venus, um, while it's, you know, in the first house there, it is besieged. It's besieged. (laughs) And um, Saturn. And when we were talking before about this, I came up with a concept that my dad, um, you know, a sporting metaphor that I've inherited off my father about the hospital pass. And it's um, something to do with, like, rugby, where you, like, you throw the ball even though you know the guy you've thrown the ball to is just about to get smashed in a tackle. And it's what Albanese will inherit should he win the election. And I am inclined to say that he will. I'll, um, you know, pop my neck out there. Um, Just because that moon is right at the end. So this is like the mood, the, you know, the emotional feeling of it. And... The fact that it's like seven minutes, only seven minutes off of, um, you know, ingressing into Scorpio, another Mars ruled sign, I don't think that is a good thing for the Prime Minister. Um, Scorpio, the moon in Scorpio is not super comfortable. It can be vengeful. And I am leaning towards some um, vengeance democracy style at um, yeah, the ballot box where people just sort of, you know, Ballot yeah. box backlash. Oh, beautiful. You can write for the daily. Mm, yeah, I do love a good headline. Um, I definitely, Al, Al, you can see from the moon being so close to the end of Libra and being like just, just about to enter, well, in, in a Placidus chart, it is in the 10th house. What you have here is that's all we're going to be hearing about. And that's what we're going to be thinking about. And you can see from the events of the last two weeks um, that when the moon moves across into Mars, that's anger. That is so much anger. Um, and Pluto there being at that 28 degrees of Capricorn, it's it's anger at institutions and authority, people that are supposed to be there um, to help us out. Um, And there's that sense of Pluto being right there just above the ascendant is it's it's drastic developments that are uh, still slightly hidden away. There's kind of this this thing that we're not seeing. And it makes me wonder, we've had a few uh, items in the news lately about um, Chinese people here in Australia who are paying political parties large, large amounts of money. And I think that's going to come up again, Kim. I think we're going to find out that funds are coming from China um, and aren't being declared maybe or um, they're being used in a very 12th house way. Mm. So I think that one's going to come up again. Being an election year, Polly's all hang out together in Canberra. They all know each other's dirty secrets and this stuff will eventually rear its head. With that square to the moon, the moon will uh, shine a light uh, on the hidden things. Yeah. Um, regarding that, so I think the one of my sort of like, you know, like if I dipped a spoon into this chart and tasted it, it's like, hmm, tastes like an information war. Um, because you've got that third house um, sun, so that's about information, rumours, propaganda, newspapers. And in the, like the quadrant house systems, um, that 23 degrees Neptune is, I think it was busted us right on the cusp of the third house. And I'm like, yeah. oh, my gosh, someone's telling porky pies. Yeah. Um, it, it's not truth. Um, and if you think back to the um, Federation chart that um, – Love of, a, love of a yarn um, in the publishing sector, the um, closeness, the closeness, the conjunction between Mercury and Jupiter, that aspect is repeated here in Pisces. And I just think there's, there's rumours and things and news. And I'm just wondering um, what old Mr Murdoch's going to be up to in the coming year regarding this election. I think he could even drop off the perch. I was just going to say that. 
Absolutely. Yeah. And one another thing I'd like to mention now, the Queen. Our, the Queen is our figurehead here in Australia. We are uh, um, ruled by a monarchy that is on the other side of the world, um, part of their Commonwealth. She, I don't think she lasts a year. Now, I don't, I don't mean to say this in a very flippant way because it's so sad, but she, is, she has been unwell. Um, there's definitely issues there with someone in authority not making it through to the end of the year. And I believe that when that happens, Australia will then be back up for the Republic debate. The problem with this is, um, and as a staunch Republican, uh, my sister said to me many, many, many years ago when we were fighting to the death because she's Queen Betty all the way, who would you put in charge if we don't have the Queen and thus the Governor-General? Who do you put in charge? And there is no one. We've become very distrustful of authority. Best candidate just died, warning. Yeah, yeah, Warney. And before that, it would have been Steve Irwin. We do love that charismatic leader. Scott Morrison is not charismatic. Uh, Anthony Albanese is not charismatic. Um, I was looking at this earlier when I was writing my notes and wondering who is the closest female to being the new Anthony Albanese. So who have we got there? Because that would make sense with this chart that a woman comes into power. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I know that with Scott Morrison, people say that his wife, Jenny, runs the ship, but I doubt that's true. I think it's just propaganda. Um, yeah, so there is, there's definitely one of the things that we're going to see this year is um, national leaders not making it through to the end of the year. Yeah. Um, Australians um, as well, like right? people that are in the news, that idea yeah. of celebrity, um, yeah, that, that sense of glamour that they have. Um, yeah. I think Jupiter in um, Pisces brings a bit of, you know, glamour and belief, like people that kind of, you know, touch our hearts, even though they're just kind of like ordinary people. Um, mm. that we're like overly attached to because they have a larger than life presence in who we are. But yeah, you've got the um, Lord of the Eighth, um, you know, conjunct Jupiter there, some guiding lights in a way. Um, yeah, could. Yeah, definitely. And another thing with that sun in the third house there um, in a Mars ruled sign. So once again, we're going to see transport issues. Now, Australia is huge. And getting stuff from one side of Australia to the other is always going to be problematic, whether it's up and down or across, whichever. But it seems like just getting um, stuff across state borders has been an issue for 2021 up until now. That is going to keep happening. I wouldn't be surprised if we see some sort of stop, start kind of situation. It's Mars, so it's severing. Um, we, at the moment, trains have been down in southeast Queensland. Yeah. Um, because of the flooding, I think that truckies and and um, people who are involved in moving stuff from one part of Australia to the other are going to be in focus. And the part of fortune sitting there in Cancer in the sixth house um, is fortune favouring the worker. Yeah. So if they go on strike, mm -hmm. they might just get what they want. Because they deserve it, don't they? They work bloody hard. Teachers, uh, maybe, Kim? Carers, childcare workers. Um, you mentioned, like, people that move food, um, you know, because cancer is sustenance. It's literally yeah. what we put in our mouth. Um, yeah, so people that move the food around, because moon is a very mobile, um, it's the fastest moving planet in um, the cosmos, zodiac, the solar system. Um, yeah, so it is that movable stuff that we do need to get around. So yeah, food security transport is going to um, yeah be a uh, be a thing. Um, and um, that that Aries ruled third house with regard to Australia and our neighbours. It, I'm thinking that we're going to piss off a few of them. Um, which we do. I mean, that's politics, but there's definitely, definitely all maybe borders shut down hard again. I, I can't actually see the border thing being as much of an issue as what it was in previous years, but um, 
how how do we we're seen as a part of Asia and we're annoying very significant parts of Asia at the moment with our politics. So that will be very interesting to see see what happens there. I um, think, yeah, foreign affairs, if you look at the, the Ninth House rulers, Venus, like she's hemmed in. Like, you know, that holiday to Bali isn't going to be as easy as it used to be. Um, you know, people can still get around, but it, it's full of... It's not as relaxing. You can't relax about this because, um, you know, of what's happened in the past, that separation from the square to Uranus, um, but the besiegement is just not comfortable. Um, no, definitely not. It's full of unpleasant surprises, essentially. Um, I just wanted to discuss Saturn ruling that 12th house, Kim, because mm-hmm. nursing homes have been in the news for the last 12 months like never before. Yep. These are a part of our society that we just assume they operate. And we have seen COVID has really, really had a huge impact on our nursing homes for the elderly and for people um, who aren't well. And I think that's that's going to be a thing that needs to be dealt with by the government, but they're going to try and pop it back into um the quiet bits of the news and i'm yeah it's square to the nodal axis that saturn um yeah matching together um Um, not doing the government any favors no not at all so so that's just just a curiosity there because um pluto is there so there's still a lot of deaths happening they're just not being broadcast in the news anymore uh, like they were. You have to go and hunt for that information now to see how many COVID deaths there have been. And that's the, the Neptunian smearing of that third house cast flag will just hide it. If, if it's not in the news, it's not happening. So the media is, um, yeah, definitely something to watch. And there has been, I don't know, with the, the current flood situation, nobody's talking about COVID anymore. Like, why can't I get this? Why can't I bring my, um, you know, relative in northern New South Wales? Oh, damn it. I can't get a Big Mac um, for those that enjoy that. Like, you know, there are these um, immediate impacts there around just things that you take for granted and expect. Easy pleasure um, isn't accessible. There's that siege Venus again. Pleasure just, um, yeah. And that looks like it is... Um, yeah, set to continue. I think the, the Mercury sextile to Pluto before it changes signs into Aries is, um, yeah, interesting. Mercury is very active. Um, it's, you know, almost as prominent and busy as, as Mars, I would say, in this chart. Um, so words, ideas, conversations, tricky lies um, are going to be Totally exposed by that sextile to Pluto. Um, yeah, and then I think the shift, and this is probably an optimistic take on it, once all that kind of smoke and mirrors type stuff is dealt with, the, the spin, which um, is going to be phenomenal um, with the election cycle, um, should be alleviated. Perhaps, you know, the, the bubble pops when um, Mercury moves into Aries. I'd like to think that that is when we can start having um, some straight conversations around the hidden deaths, around, um, you know, a shift in the national narrative that's less based on pie in the sky and more, well, let's tell some truths. Yeah. That's, a, that's a big word for Australia. Um, and, you know, talk straight about who we are and also how we're governed um, because that Mercury whips into Aries um, and then creates a sextile to um, Saturn there. So, sorry, not Saturn, Mars. So there's like, there's like a pokey thing. Some, somebody says something or, yeah, some, something lets the cat out of the bag. Like there's an exposure of those secrets. Absolutely. So now that we've been uh, cynical, jaded and all doomy and gloomy, how about we... The 11th house, 
let's have a look at the 11th house because it's ruled by a Jupiter sign by Sagittarius. So what are we hoping for, Kim? Well, we've, I've also been looking at the fifth house as well um, because Jupiter and Mercury are together. So the fifth and the 11th, they're fun. Um, entertainment's back, baby. Yeah. Um, you can go to the pub. You can go to the theatre. You can go shout at your football team. You can um, dance that oh. hard that you break the floor of an old theatre in Sydney. <laughs> that happened last night. It happened a couple of days ago. The floor fell in on the Enmore Theatre. Um, and if you grew up in New South Wales, you probably went to a concert or two there. And that just made me giggle. Um, yeah, but we've got, we do have some hopefulness here, people. There's uh, the second house. That's our resources and our values. We're so, ready to spend. Yeah, we're ready. And we've been, last year it was spending on small items that went through the mail. This year we're hitting the shops. Um, we're still, still doing online spending. A post office with the third house sun postal services are in high demand um but yeah we we're spending and we're happy about it yeah yeah but, and but, um, yeah we I, time. I also noted last year which is quite curious because of the rise in tiktok spirituality um that we had the midheaven last year at 20 degrees of cancer trining neptune at 20 degrees of pisces so there was going to be an increase in spiritual or holistic uh fascination from the public and that has happened um it seems like every human worth their salt has now got tarot cards um i can see that that's that's going to increase there like with sagittarius on the 11th house cusp there's we're looking externally for hope I wouldn't be surprised if we see a slight resurgence in attendance to um, church services. Yeah, yoga, meditation retreats. Yep, yep. But as a nation, um, we've been dwindling with attendance to physical churches and we want some hope. It's been a lot has been happening um, and it's a way for you to be a part of the community again. Um, and with that Mercury... Uh, and Jupiter conjunct in Pisces, um, we want to feel good together. Yeah, that shared experience. And I guess for some people like you, some people find that in a church, but there's also that like pub choir where people kind of get into like a group situation and there's, um, you know, a prescribed activity and it's all about lifting the human spirit. Like that is what um, we want to do. So, yeah, the, the arts will make a comeback, sport will make a comeback, all the things that, um, yeah, that we, we love to do and enjoy ourselves, perhaps a little too much at times, but that's the, the silver lining, the hope, oh, getting back to the, the beach and swimming, like the, the good version of water, um, those uplifting connections. Absolutely. Yeah. And travel, travel. Travel is back on the cards. In my real-life job, um, I've seen a resurgence in people uh, downloading passport applications. And yeah. I cannot tell you, you don't notice something when it disappears, but you sure notice it when it's back. And it's back, baby. Yeah. People want to feel alive again. Um, yeah. So, it's, yeah, it's a mixed bag, but... Um, there, there is some fun to be had. Um, yeah, I wonder if um, there'll be more shoe shopping as well. Maybe that's just me. Ah, there's always time for more shoe I shopping. <laughs> well, you know, if you're going to go out like partying and you're going to go, you know, to special places, you probably need new footwear because yeah. it's really fun. Yeah, I have a friend who has spent the last two years crying over her inability to wear her beautiful shoes um out in public and yeah so that's that's something that she sorely missed over the last two years she'll be happy yeah um do we do we want to open up the chat for everyone else glenn commented on the moon being in the vr combustor kim and i as soon as i saw that i went mm -hmm. do you want to explain a little bit 
Yeah, so the beer combustor is the fiery road. Um, so it's it's a bumpy area for the moon to travel through from um, the mid degrees of um, Libra through the mid degrees of Scorpio. It's just not smooth. It's angsty, and you've kind of got to respond, but you won't necessarily respond in um, a smooth and harmonious, well-rounded way. It's it's challenging territory for the moon. Um, I also noted that I, I think it has a subtle influence. It's probably not something that you would want to see in an Aries Ingress chart. You wouldn't go, oh, yay, the moon's in the beer combustor. Um, but I think it's just like one of the things to consider. I think that the moon's really important in this chart because it's the highest planet and pretty much everything else is um underneath down the bottom of the chart so there's a lot simmering under the surface and I think the moon is where um there's going to be like bubbling up it's a bit like how emotions bubble up um and I think collective mood is going to um you know bubble up so you know things that trend on twitter and other social media things um you know like whatever is sprayed across the papers and which hold is important and that we should engage with. Um, I don't know. That it's a bit of an interesting kind of um, grey area. Like, do you really care about the thing or do you care because you're told you should care? Like, it's an interesting mm, feedback. Absolutely. Um, the moon ruling the common people, which is us, um, being right at the top of the chart there and in a Venus rule sign, once again, I really want to stress that there will be food supply chain issues this year. And um, it's, it's very much when you said the fiery road, that's what will be the issue there. It will be well, transport. Well, cans of baked yeah. Beans. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, uh, Go and buy a chest freezer. Start storing frozen meals in there, all your leftovers. That's if the power stays on going. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, it's, we have hope. So when the moon's at the top of the natal chart, that person will often find that they have favours given to them freely. They're just fortunate. And as for all of the cynicism that Kim and I drop into these Aries ingress charts, it's because you have to be grounded in reality. It's not all sunshine and roses. It's a mundane chart. It's not a natal chart. But when the moon is at the top of the chart, um, things might go a little more our way as the common people than what they have in previous years. And for that, we should be grateful. Yeah, that's that's true. Throw us a bone. Throw um, us a bone. Or yeah. some, I don't know, dams that can hold water and, you know, fire, fireproof sure. places because if we're sitting here now recovering from floods and it won't be long before we will be sitting here and dealing with the repercussions of bushfires because that is Australia. Yeah, yeah, that's true. And um, that those difficulties are set to continue. I just can't see how they will not. Um, it's just kind of like business as usual. Like, I don't know. If I think one, one more reporter used the word unprecedented. Um, there are precedents for this. Precedents for these floods. It, it, there's so many precedents. Um, so stop saying it. It's not a surprise. Yeah. And what was the other one that we hear a lot at the moment since the bushfires in 2020? It was one in a hundred year, yeah. once in a hundred year event, except yeah. these events. Yeah. We've now had three of those floods in the last decade. So once in a hundred years, but we've had three. I think they can knock that one off their headline list. Yeah, and this is what I mean about the tricky words that, um, yeah, the media use. Um, but yeah, so so pay attention to what you pay attention to, and um, don't let that um, Pluto behind the scenes fool you. I don't think we can be fooled anymore. I think um, we're all pretty much onto it. Um, but we need that joyful release as well. Excellent. 
So any other questions or comments from the, from the gallery? <laughs> Can people unmute? Thank Hungary. you very much. Did Thank you enjoy you. that? <laughs> yes, I think, oh, why are not more people tuning in? This is so important to know. It really is. It's, it's astounding um, how accurate the ingress chart can be for a nation. Yeah. yeah. And we've got, we've got worldwide events at the moment um, that will have repercussions for Australia so what it's a global situation what's happening in Russia and the Ukraine at the moment and so when we're talking about food supply chain issues and all the rest of it um, that that will also carry over worldwide but there will be little things where we will look back and go ah yeah, yeah. shortages yeah and Logistic difficulties too, which I think will be the large contributor to a, a lot of the, um, the local issues in that regard. Um, yeah, we didn't want to get too much into um, the international influences because this is set in Canberra. It's like yeah. contained in a way, but of course, um, you know, we are global citizens as well. And um, yeah, I think anybody is, yeah, you, you no, there is enough not. happening here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a lot. But just remember, this is a very integral year where your vote will count, except for Glenn, because Glenn's not in Australia. <laughs> but send good wishes our way. But, yeah, it's um, every vote matters. Yeah, it absolutely does. So, look, if you're not enrolled or you, you know, you're not sure you're enrolled, um, get out there and get yourself enrolled. Um, it is important. I'm pretty sure you can do it while you're online. And if you have been um, impacted by the, the floods and stuff, make sure your voice is heard. That is the, the best way you can send feedback and, um, you know, advocate for change is by bringing up your local member of parliament, getting yourself enrolled and telling them what you want. And if that's, um, you know, flood mitigation, if that's action on climate and energy policy, you know, get in there and tell them. Um, yeah, I think mining companies just on that um, because yes. that house, they're going to be yeah. able to oh, screw the taxpayer keeping paying for this terrible yep. situation. Um, and yeah, all the volunteers that come out, like meanwhile, yeah, coal, fun, coal companies, what are, they haven't said boo. No, but they've been pushed from the collective consciousness because of dot, dot, dot. So it'll be interesting to see what comes back around. Yes, that Uranus and the North Node in the fourth house, mining companies and the North Node, there's big money floating around, big, big money. And um, I think they'll be back, back in into our consciousness um, because uh, it's very, very much gone out of our, it, we haven't really thought about it, have we? Have you heard anything from Gina Reinhardt lately, Kim? No, she's probably just sitting in a bar full of money. Um, mm, could tripling her wealth. Yeah. Yes. But, um, yes, the fourth house, when Uranus is in the fourth house, um, there's definitely huge changes coming up for the mining industry or in the way that things are dealt with in mines. Uh, I hope there's not another catastrophe. Um, but no, yeah, I, sudden I unpredictable hope they pay taxes. That'd be nice. That'd be um, good. And like proper taxes, not all these subsidies and things that they get. Um, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, guess okay. what? Okay. <laughs> we did it. We did. So this one's recorded for posterity. <laughs> yes. Thank you for um, the people that tuned in live. And thank you. Like, shout out to Penny. We saw you trying to join. I really, um, you know, hope you're okay and your internet connection comes back soon. Um, Penny is in a flood area in northern New South Wales. And, um, yeah, while she hasn't been flooded, she is um, yeah. all communications isolated, um, which has... Yeah problems of itself um so 
sending our love and best wishes and solidarity to everybody who has been impacted up and down the coast. Um, Kim and I were both very fortunate, um, but it was alarming. Yeah. Yeah. And this chart, um, yeah, it, it advocates for change. Change is possible and I reckon we can, um, yeah. Yeah. Make something happen collectively. Yeah. All right, everybody, thank you so much for tuning in. It is wonderful to get this recorded and um, we'll pop this on um, Big Scary YouTube, I think, um, so people can tune in and listen to our predictions and see which ones come up. Feel free to comment and go, oh, my gosh, you're terribly wrong about that. Um, but also, like, give us a thumbs up when things go well. Um, you know, we've stuck our neck out here and it is scary, um, but, um, yeah. I, I feel good about the the quality of our analysis and um, yeah, let's go. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Thanks everyone. Bye.